Ready. Aim. Shoot. Welcome to Arrows of Revival. God wants to use you as an arrow in his revival. And he's releasing arrows across the world for a world revival. Tune in as we discuss these arrows. Does repentance bring revival or does revival bring repentance? Greetings, this is Bishop Reed here with another episode of Arrows of Revival. And uh, that question I just asked, I saw that article somewhere online. Uh, I saw the topic and I was interested in reading it. The question was, does repentance bring revival or does revival brings repentance? Or which comes first? Repentance and then as a result, revival or revival and as a result, repentance. And the article made the argument that revival comes first. It makes the argument that we can do nothing to bring revival, that we just have to wait on God in his time. Uh, not that his article wasn't disregarding repentance or saying repentance believers should be doing ongoing. However, uh, my difference in the article is that the answer to the question, does repentance bring revival or does revival bring repentance or does repentance come first? Does revival come first? I said the answer is both and, both and. What do I mean by that? I'm both and meaning that repentance does come before revival and revival does come before repentance, both and. Uh, uh, repentance brings revival and revival brings repentance. And I'm going to go into that some more. But we find that many times that uh, theologians, uh, sometimes those of us who are trying to formulate doctrines or we're trying to explain doctrine, we many times go into error, we make mistakes, we fall short because we are not willing to accept the tension that oftentimes is in the word of God. I mean by the tensions that oftentimes is both and. For example, God is one and God shows himself in three persons. Or for example, our salvation in Christ is secure and you can walk away from your salvation. Or again, see that tension, you struggle with that tension. You want to say it's just one or the other when it's oftentimes both and. Or as, a, as a, another example, Jesus is God and Jesus is was a man. <laughs> Glory be to God. So both and, both and. And in this case, when it comes to revival, when it comes to revival, repentance comes before. Revival and revival come before repentance, or put a different way, revival brings repentance, repentance brings revival. This is scripture the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 57, Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabited eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. God revives the spirit of the humble and of the contrite. The person that's humble and contrite is a person broken before the Lord, is a person that will repent. God will revive the spirit of those who will humble themselves before him. So the question today or the topic today is why should the church repent? The topic today is why should the church repent? And I just answer one of the reasons because repentance brings revival. Why should the church repent? Because repentance brings revival. And, you know, glory be to God. Uh, when we talk about revival here, we're not just talking about personal revival. We're talking about corporate revival as a church. And across the land, whether you want revival in the nation, revival in your country, that's what we're talking about. And the question uh, that I was answering, that repentance 
does bring revival. And revival causes repentance. Of course, when revival comes, it causes people to repent. When revival happens, it causes sinners to repent. It causes believers to seek after God. It causes believers to see their sins and repent. Praise God. But repentance also will usher in revival. Why? Because when God sees a man that is humble and a contrite spirit, God said he will dwell with that man. This is what the scripture says again. He said, I dwell in a high and holy place. That's Isaiah 57 verse 15. I dwell in a high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So God will will come, will, will visit those who are contrite, who are seeking him. Uh, the Bible says in James chapter 4, I believe, uh, James chapter 4, I believe verse 7, uh, verse 8, verse 9. Let me just look it up real quick. Uh, so the book of James, praise God. The book of James chapter 4. Yes, the book of James chapter 4. Praise God. And it says, verse 4, James 4, verse 4, but he give it more grace. Wherefore, he said, God resists the proud, but he give it grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from thee. Verse 8, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. So we talk about the contrite one, the humble one. We're talking about one that is willing to draw nigh to God. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. What am I saying? The contrite person, the humble person is one who will repent of their sins, who will repent of wrongs who will repent and seek to for God to purify them for God to purge them who will seek to draw nigh to God and this will usher in revival God said he'll dwell with the one and he will revive the spirit of the one that's of a humble and a contrite spirit another evidence of that is in the book of Joel chapter 2 the book of Joel chapter 2 you see when we are answering these questions, we've got to use the word of God, not just our opinion or knowledge. So the Bible says in Joel chapter 2, verse 12, Joel 2, verse 12, said, Therefore also now said the Lord, turn even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Yes, and then if you go down more, verse 13, he says, call a solemn assembly. Verse uh, 16 says, gather the people, assemble the elders. Verse 17, let the priests and ministers weep before the, the porch and the altar. And let them say, spare thy people, O God. And, and so God said, when this happens, when you repent, when you call that fast, that solemn assembly, when the people gather together and seek after God, he says then in Joel 2 verse 18, then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Verse 10, yet the Lord will answer and say unto his people, behold, I will send you corn and wine. If I go down more, verse to verse 28, it says, and it shall come to pass afterward, thou pour out my spirit upon all flesh. What am I pointing out here? That God calls upon his people to repent. And he said, if you repent, I will hear. I will be jealous for my land. I will, I will restore you. And then I will pour out my spirit upon you. And I'm saying that to say, yes, when revival comes, it just it does bring deliverance. It does ca cause the hearts of men to cry out in repentance. But also, God often moves upon his people to repent, to repent. When his people seek him in repentance, turn away from their sins, it brings revival. So why should the church repent to usher in revival? Praise God. Why should the church repent? There's a lot of, there's some teaching going around nowadays that believers don't need to repent. 
and it's such a lie, it's such it's so unbiblical, it doesn't agree with the word of God. The word of God teaches that the church should actually repent when there is sin, when there is wrong. In the church, God calls upon us to repent. So why should the church repent? Well, the church should repent because it ushers in revival. We should have a spirit of humility. We should be of a contrite heart, a humble spirit. We're always seeking to draw closer to God. And as we grow closer to God, that we see the glory of the Lord, it causes us to see where we fall short. I am not talking about self-condemnation. I'm not talking about repenting of sins that you've already repented of. That's that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the, the church should be in a state where we repent, where we see ourselves, we see where we fall short. We ask the Lord to forgive us. The Lord purifies us and we draw closer and closer to God in greater fellowship with him. We, we walk closer to him and closer to his will. We become more like Jesus. And when the church is in that kind of mindset, that kind of heart to draw closer to the Lord, it does bring revival. So why should the church repent? I'm going to give you several reasons why the church of today, the church today, the church of today, why the church today should repent. First of all, the church today should repent to purify, to purify from immorality, to purify the congregation from immorality, to purify the congregation from immorality. Now, listen to what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church, and here's what Paul says to them. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such a fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, and this is verse 2, I'm sorry, this is 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1 and 2. So in verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 5, it says, And he are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that had done this deed might be taken away from among you. So what is happening here? Here Paul is addressing uh, a report he heard from the Corinthians uh, that, uh, or from the Corinthians church, that there was uh, a fornication among them. And I mean, a vile, a vile type because uh, one, this man was with his father, sleeping with his father's wife. And here is what Paul said to them. He said, you guys are puffed up. You're not ashamed. You're not embarrassed that this thing has taken place among you. You're puffed up. You're, you're treating the matter lightly. You don't see the need to mourn. You don't see the need to clear the church from this manner. When we think of the church of today, when we think of the church in the United States and, and many places around the world, we see so much uncleanness taking place. And it just seems like, Christians have gotten so dull, have gotten so, uh, it, it taking it as the norm for immorality and uncleanness to be in the church. And we're not ashamed anymore. We're not, we, we're not mourning. We're not grieving. We're not grieved over the things that are happening. We have uh, many time ministers of the gospel who are found in immorality. And I mean, that we just know about because sometimes it comes on the news or it's known publicly. But there are so many believers now that are living in uh, immorality. So in your local congregations and churches, you may be aware of so many Christians that are living in immorality and sin. And sometimes these things can become so rampant that we just take it as the norm. It doesn't grieve us anymore. It doesn't break our hearts anymore. It doesn't cause us to mourn anymore. It doesn't cause us to, to, to hang our heads down low anymore. And, and this is what Paul was correcting the Corinthians about, that this, this grievous sin, immorality, had taken place among them, and they were just puffed up about it. They were just going on the same way. You imagine the church today, so much of the church today, uh, we have all kinds of sin and immorality happening in our midst, uh, and, and, and sometimes in the public, in the public being aware of this, and we just keep on going the same way. We just keep on doing what we're doing. There's no mourning. There's no weeping. There's no calling out to God for purging, for change. And this is what Paul was correcting the Corinthian church 
on. That you're puffed up. You should be mourning. You should be crying out. You should be repenting of this thing. So he says to them in verse 2, And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that, that he that had done this deed might be taken away from among you. And if you read on that chapter, you see that Paul says to them that, that, that this brother who had done this, this immoral thing need to be disciplined. He said they need to be mourning so that this thing shall be taken away from among them. Now, I want to look at 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7. Why should the church repent? Why should the church of today repent? Why should the church of today repent to purify the congregation from immorality? Praise the name of Jesus. Now, the first Corinthians chapter 5, I just want to read verse 7, just to point out something further here. First Corinthians 5 verse 7 says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that he may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrifice for us. See, what we got to understand here is that when there's immorality in the church, immorality in the congregation, if it's treated lightly, if it's looked over, if it's disregarded, then many times you, you, you see immorality among leaders, and if it's treated lightly and just looked over, what happens is that that leaven can leaven the whole lump. In other words, the corruption spreads the corruption increases uh just like how uh just a little yeast a little yeast in the flour and it causes the whole flour to spread as it bakes even so just that that immorality left unchecked uh left without repentance left without uh being dealt with in any form or fashion it, that that corruption can spread can cause it to increase so Verse 7 of 1 Corinthians 5 says, purge out the old leaven. How does a congregation does that? Like the Corinthian church, this brother sinned. But Paul was calling upon them as a church to take the matter seriously, to cry out to God, to be clear of this matter, to be free from this matter, uh, or at least this brother to be disciplined, or at least this brother to, to be disciplined and to be restored back uh, into a right relationship with God. And there needs to be that kind of attitude in the church. Uh, we, we need to be people that cry out to God, uh, calling upon God to purge the church from the immorality that is in. It first start with us in our own lives individually. If you find that you have been in immorality, you've been in sin, ask the Lord to forgive you. Ask the Lord to cleanse you. Do not just get up and move on. Do not just get up and move on. Do not just, you commit adultery, you commit fornication, you, you lust, you, 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 you are watching something on television or you see a lustful thing and, or you, 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 you are looking at the wrong thing and you, you, you found yourself in lust in the wrong fantasies and thoughts or, or pornography. And then you just go on the same way, go on to church, some go and do ministry the same way. And I'm not truly repented of their sin. They know they're going to go back to it again the next day. And to repent of their sin. No, we got to go before the Lord and cry out, Lord, wash me, cleanse me, forgive me, purge me from my transgression, cleanse me from my sin. When David saw himself in his sin that he has done, the Bible said in Psalm chapter 51, he said, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression and cleanse me thoroughly from my sin. We got to be broken before God. We cannot treat sin, treat immorality lightly. It will infest us and take us over. No, we got to repent. We got to repent. And so same in our congregation. When we see sin, immorality in our congregation, we ought to repent. Now, in that case, I'm, I'm not saying uh, you, you, you committed a sin if you find there's uh immorality in your church, in your local church, or we find as people of God, we see immorality in the church in general. Uh, oftentimes, 
we got to have corporate repentance. What do I mean by that? that even though you may not have been the one or, or intercessor repentance, even though you may not have been the one that sinned, you're still asking God to purify the church, to purge the church. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel, we know Daniel was a godly living man. We know that Daniel served the Lord faithfully. But we know that the reason why Daniel was in the land of Babylon, it was under Babylon, Bab, uh, Babylonian reign, was because uh, the Babylonians had taken, taken captive many of the Israelites. Why? Because they had sinned. And Daniel saw the need to repent uh, on behalf of the nation of Israel. Now, he was repenting because of his own personal sin. He was doing corporate repentance. He was praying uh, for God to cleanse the nation. He was asking, he was interceding on behalf of his nation and asking the Lord to forgive him. And so we ought to do the same. We see such rampant sin in the church. We ought to be praying and crying out to God to cleanse us, to purify us, to wash us, yes, and to make us clean. Daniel prayed. I'm going to look at Daniel chapter, Daniel chapter 9 and verse 3. As you see the prayer of Daniel, you see how Daniel prayed corporately in repenting on behalf uh, of his people. Daniel chapter 9, and verse 3, he said, And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned. That's verse 5 of Daniel 9. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. So Daniel repented for himself, but he also repented on behalf of his people. So we have sinned. And surely the church today, many of us have sinned. And we got to intercede on behalf of the church. So it starts with you. We would intercede on behalf of the church. Lord, purify the church. Cleanse us. We have sinned. We have fallen short in our standard of morality. Cleanse us and wash us. So why should the church repent? To purify the congregation from immorality. Revelation chapter 2, verse 22. Behold, God speaking concerning a woman named Jezebel in one of the churches in the book of Revelation. Whether her actual name was Jezebel or the Lord most likely was using that name as a representation of a same spirit that was upon this person in this church. And, 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 and God said, I gave her space for her to repent and she repented not. And Revelation 2.22 says, behold, I will cast her into a bed and then that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. So why should we repent? To purify the congregation from immorality. Praise God. Praise God. Here's a second reason. Why should the church repent? To clear a matter. To clear a matter. One of the things that we fall short in the body of Christ so often is we leave matters uh, un, un, uh, uh, it, it unresolved. We leave matters unresolved. We, we leave matters just hanging in the air. We don't deal with it. Uh, we, don't, we don't make sure that we are clear before God and clear before conscience. And, and oftentimes not clear before the public. The public look at the church and wonder where the church stands because there's a lack of clarity. So. The Corinthian church, uh, when they were, they were found fault, at fault in a matter, uh, they had, had found itself in sin. And Paul addresses them again. Uh, and it could have been the same matter with the man that, 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 that slept with his father's wife and, 
and how they were so nonchalant about it, how they were so careless concerning it, and how they were so puffed up and proud in the way they dealt with it. But later on, after Paul gave them instructions and corrected them, they really cleared themselves of the matter. And, and here's how Paul put it, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8. Paul is speaking to the Corinthians church in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 8. And Paul said, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the, that the same epistle had made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Verse 9 of 1 Corinthians, verse 9 of 1 Corinthians, oh, sorry, verse 9 of 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9 of 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Now I rejoice, not that he were made sorry, but that he sorrowed to repentance. Now he's speaking to the church. So I got to say this at this point. The idea that Christians are not to repent is a lie. That doctrine is a lie. Right here in the scripture, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 9. Now I rejoice, not that he were made sorry, but that he sorrowed to repentance. Paul is rejoicing that the people, the Corinthian church people, repented. <laughs> so let me read that again. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 9. Now I rejoice, not that he were made sorry, but that he sorrowed to repentance. For he were made sorry after a godly manner that he might receive damage by us in nothing. Verse 10 of 2 Corinthians 7, For godly sorrow work at repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world work at debt. Verse 11 of 2 Corinthians 7, For behold, this, behold, this selfsame thing that he sorrowed after a godly sword, what carefulness it wrought in you. So what happened to the Corinthian people is that they, they, they had a godly sorrow, and the godly sorrow caused them to come to a place of repentance. Where is the godly sorrow in the church? We ought to be people that when we see sin in the church, when we see wrong, when we see false doctrine, when we see immorality, when we see all manner of sins, when we see the complacency of the church, uh, we ought to have a godly sorrow. We ought to be grieved in our hearts. Where's the godly sorrow? For behold, the same, same thing that he sorrowed after a godly sorrow. What carefulness it wrought in you. Godly sorrow brings a carefulness. Yea, what clearing of yourself. Godly sorrow causes us to clear ourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. So, godly sorrow causes us to have that zeal. To come to a place of repentance, to clear ourselves from the matter. Oh, praise God. Oh, praise God. To clear our, our conscience. So, why should the church repent? To clear ourselves from a matter. The Corinthian church, they dealt with the issue because there was a godly sorrow. They repented, they were obedient to the instructions of Paul. They got to a place of repentance that caused them to turn and did, did the will of God. In the same way, Oh, the church today should repent. What is so much matters that we need to clear ourselves off? Oh, Father God, if you're in a local church, praise God, if you see things going wrong in that church, oh, pray for the Lord to clear that matter. Pray that there'll be godly sorrow and repentance in Jesus' mighty name. Yes, the so why should the church repent? To purify the congregation from immorality, to clear a matter. Three, to purge out false doctrine. There's much false doctrine. There's much false doctrine that's going around. Uh, I'm just speaking of one of them. The the uh, this hyper grace doctrine. Uh, many in that camp uh, teaches that there's no need for Christians to repent. There's no need for Christians to confess their sins, and that's just not the truth. We've, we've already read scriptures here that is in the opposite direction of that. And and so sometimes there's false doctrine that's going around that we got to purge ourselves from. And, and God spoke to the church, one of the churches in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 2, verse 14. He says, but I have a few things against you because 
you have there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Verse 15 of Revelation 2. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Verse 16. Repent, or else I'll come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So God called upon the church to repent from the false doctrine that's in their midst. Now listen, you may have believed a doctrine that is that is not true, that's not godly. You may even be a preacher and you're you're teaching things like there's no need to repent. You're teaching things like there's no there's no need for believers to to give their offering in tithes. You you you're preaching things like you know whatever a person does, whatever they live, they are saved. One says one says they gave their life to Christ at some point. They could live any manner of way. Whatever it is, doctrine you're teaching, contrary to the word of God, you can repent. You can repent. In church, we got to cry out to God for these false doctrines to be removed in the midst of the church. In Jesus' name. Why should the church repent? To revive from backsliding. To revive from backsliding. Now, what am I talking about? Now, I'm not talking about backsliding, going back to the world, or backsliding where you uh, you turn away from Jesus Christ, you give up your salvation. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about leaving our first love. Many believers have left their first love, have left that place of zeal and passion for the things of the Lord. God corrects one of the churches in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 2 verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Verse 5 of Revelation 2, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. Why should the church repent? To revive from backsliding. It's not only individual believers that backslide. Sometimes local congregations backslide in their love for the Lord. What do I mean by that? The, the vision that that church was operating by, the, the passion that that church had for the things of the Lord. Many times, over time, some churches lose that passion. They, they lose that vision they had uh, from the Lord. They lose that zeal they had from the Lord. They lose that first love. And God called upon churches like that to repent, to repent. Glory to God. Now, all everything I'm saying, it all starts with us individually. But perhaps you are a church leader, a pastor, a minister, you're hearing me, or you're someone influential in your church, or even just a member where you, you can say something to your pastor or to a leader. You see that the, the zeal, the passion, the love uh, for God that was there is waning in the church. You, you, you got to begin repenting. It starts with you. Repent yourself where you're falling short, where you've gone back in your first love. Repent on behalf of your church that God will reignite the passion, reignite the love, and revive them back uh, from their backslidden state. To remember the first love, to remember the vision, to remember the passion that the Lord gave, to remember uh, the, the, the heart, the, the heart of God for what that church should be doing and that they get back to that place. And pray concerning that and cry out to God to bring a reviving. Why should the church repent? To revive from backsliding. Why should the church repent? To come out of a place of unfruitfulness. To revive from backsliding, not only in leaving first love, but in being unfruitful. It's not God's will that the church is unfruitful. Revelation 3 verse 2 and 3 he said to this church, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Verse 3 of Revelation 2, remember therefore how those receive and heard and hold fast and repent. Yes, sometimes the church gets to a place where it seems like it's dying. There's no growth. There is no fruitfulness. And when I say growth, I both mean in quality and quantity. In quality meaning the people are not growing in the things of the Lord. And so then they're rather shrinking. They seem like they're dying. They're, they're losing out. Prayer time is gone. Uh, the, the love for the word of God is gone. 
uh, the, 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 that passion for the things of God is dying. And, and not only that, there is no, there is no quantity growth in the terms. There's no winning of souls. Uh, there's, there's, there's no one going out and winning souls to the Lord. There, there, there's no focus on winning the loss for Christ. It is not God's will that the church is unfruitful. They need to be a repentance, repentance of this vaccine state in Jesus mighty name. Why should the church repent to renew the spiritual fire? To renew the spiritual fire. Last of all, they talk about the Laodicean church in Revelation 3, 15 to 19. This church was neither hot nor cold. God said, verse 16 of Revelation 3, So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods and I have need of nothing. And knowest not thou that are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Yes, many in the, the church today, we, we, we are filled with material things. We are filled with so much different resources. We have so much, but that spiritual fire is missing. That spiritual fire is not there. And God says in Revelation 3.19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. We got to repent or renewal of the spiritual fire burning in us. We're on fire for the Lord, doing the work of the Lord with fervency, with zeal, with passion. That's why the church should repent. So many of the churches in a lukewarm state, my God, we are compromising with the world. We think like the world. We, we, we forget that. We are children of God and that the whole world lieth in wickedness. The whole world lieth in darkness. We are children of God. But so many are compromising with the world, are satisfied with just, just having church, just having church and not making any change or transformation in the world around us. This lukewarm, just accepting what the current things, the current state of society is. The Lord called us out of a lukewarm state for us to repent and receive the fire of God in Jesus' name. But why should the church repent? Because repentance ushers in revival. God promises that if we turn to him with all our hearts, Joel chapter 2, verse 12, all the way down to verse 28, God shows that if we call out to him, we seek after him, then he will be jealous for his land and he will pour out his spirit upon us. That's his promise. He calls us to repentance for that to happen. Praise God. Why should the church repent? To purify the congregation from immorality. To purge our false doctrine. To clear a matter. To revive from backsliding. And to renew spiritual fire. Church, repent. And let revival burn in your hearts. God bless you. Uh, I'm I'm gonna be doing another episode where uh, I get I had two very challenging questions that were answered by email. I'm gonna share some of that with you, uh, and um, look out on our website revivalarrows.com. Uh, there you can see the different outlines of the different teachings that are there. And if you're not on our mailing list, get on our mailing list. I want to say thank you to those who have donated into this teaching ministry, the Hours of Revival. And any one of you listening, uh, feel welcome to donate. You can go to revivalhours.com and just look for the donate button to scroll down, scroll down to the footer and look for that donate button and, and give your a, a $5 contribution a month can make a difference in getting the things done that we need to get done so that this broadcast will continue going out to you and the teachings will continue going out to you. God bless you. See you again next time on Arrows of Revival. Thank you for listening to Arrows of Revival. To hear other episodes, go to RevivalArrows.com. Again, our website is RevivalArrows.com. To contact us, email hello at RevivalArrows.com. Send us an email. 
to hello at revivalarrows.com. And remember, let God shape you and polish you as an arrow for his revival.